Welcome to Ben Navarra's podcast with your host, Ben Navarra's. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm good. Good, man. Another beautiful day here in Las Vegas. Another beautiful day yet, indeed. It's going to start getting hot, and it's going to be necessary not not my favorite temperature in the world, but we'll get there when we get there, right? Hopefully stay inside as much as we possibly can. Yeah, I'm trying to enjoy it as much as I can right now. I went out to the Hoover Dam, biked out there nice. yesterday. Oh, yeah. I got agoraphobia. Do you know what that is? Like fear of... Uh, Wide open spaces. I did not know the name of it, but yeah. <laughs> That's how nice. I felt when I got up there. I'm like, this thing is massive. I cannot believe men built this in 1931. With minimal injuries. I thought a lot of people died. I don't, it, it wasn't because of the actual construction. It was because of disease mm -hmm. uh, that people were dying. But uh, like from construction accidents, there were pretty much almost no, like there was, a, there was a number of deaths and what that number is, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I did the tour where they take, take you down underneath and you get to see all the generators and stuff like that. And one of the, our, our tour guides, I've, I think I've been two or three times now, uh, one of the tour guides was like, yeah, there really wasn't very many people dying building this thing. It's impressive because it's Isn't massive, it? and I would have expected a lot of casualties. Same, but Same. I had to. I had. I just had to get into nature and reset because I was in this YouTube conference all week. You know, sitting inside and getting inspired, but also kind of just running out the social batteries, talking to as many people as I could. Um, it is tough, but I like the name of the game. Like just constantly networking in those in those spaces, and for me, just personally, it's just it's it's a lot. Um, and having the opportunity to like get out and like be do nature things just feels good and it's a good nice reset. Uh, but I would like to talk to you a little bit more about that that YouTube conference. Uh, one, how did you find it? And then I guess like what were some key things that you learned that you found value out of? Yeah, well, shout out to Sean Canal and uh, Think Media. Uh, I think that they have an awesome operation. And they're based here in Las Vegas. I heard about them two years ago when I had moved to the area. I saw an ad advertisement, went to their uh, original conference at the M, and they had like Alex Hermosi there, Gary Vaynerchuk, and I was really impressed. And then I got, I was kind of down the next year because they didn't do the conference again the next year. So it's been two years since they've done a conference. And uh, this year they ha had uh, Dave Ramsey as a headliner, and then uh, Cody Sanchez was also there, as well as some other. Um, big people in this space and uh it was inspiring i got to meet a lot of people i kind of uh, went high ticket so there was like a platinum dinner event where i could network with people that are just killing it on youtube and in business and in personal brand and just being able to uh, talk with them ask them questions but also have them see and look at what i'm working on and have them actually really excited about what I'm doing was very validating. I have to say yeah. that um, there's a there was a eye doctor that has like over a million subscribers. He's an optometrist, and uh, he took a look at uh, the brain technology stuff that I'm working on. And he's like, "Just keep doing what you're doing. Stick on the path, and like you're 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 gonna get somewhere with this for sure." Is, is it a fairly like? Are, are there a lot of people doing what you are currently offering on YouTube? No. Um, I just took the Daryl Eves YouTube course last fall. He's uh he does channel jump starters and uh, works with a lot of names like Jimmy Donaldson, Mr. Beast, and other really big YouTube accounts. Do you remember the Squatty Potty unicorn that that poops the rainbow? Uh, have you seen that commercial? Well, anyways, he he Jamie, uh, bring it up. He yeah. he designed that commercial, um, but now he has a YouTube training company. And one of the things that they train you how to do is create a dummy account because you're actually uh, becoming your customer avatar and seeing what the AI offers you as far as video recommendations. And Fun. what was interesting is that when I became my own customer avatar and started watching my own stuff, all the algorithm wanted to offer up was my own thing. <laughs> so it, I'm having a hard time Good. finding other people that are doing something similar because a lot of what... YouTubers are doing these days is finding examples of videos that are doing well in their niche and sort of reverse engineering that, not exactly copying, but just doing their own take. Yeah. And that's difficult for me to do because I can't find anybody who's doing the same thing. I can get somewhat close if I look at like an Aura Ring review or Whoop 
or uh, even some headphone reviews, I can start to get an idea of how people do tech reviews. But what I'm doing is a little bit more scientific based neuroscience and in the Venn diagram merger of that, it's difficult to find anybody else who's doing that. So it's hard to find examples right now. So what exactly are you diving into on your YouTube channel? Right. So I am a psychiatrist by training. I spent eight years in the U S military with the Navy. And, uh, when I was doing my training at Walter Reed in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, it's right across the street from national Institute of health. They have some of the most advanced brain imaging technologies there in the world. And when I was coming into service, that was towards the end of Iraq and Afghanistan. So we had a lot of military veterans coming back that had been exposed by exposed to improvised explosive devices, IEDs. And so they had all these symptoms like vertigo, anxiety, depression that couldn't really be fully attributed to PTSD or just being uh, down at their back. There was actual physical damage to their brain tissue, which was really sad, but also validating because if you could use some of the most advanced brain imaging technologies in the world and show them like there's actual structural damage to what happened to your brain and this is why you're experiencing what you're experiencing, I brought a lot more understanding to their experience and uh, also just understanding how the brain works and also raising awareness of what can happen with head injuries like that. And we've seen that happen in the NFL lately and as well as in other industries. And it's about that time that I started talking and griping about psychiatry in general. Uh, unlike other areas of medicine, we don't have much data on the organ that we're treating, which is the brain. So there were companies back then, this is about 2014, that were starting to develop wearable brain technologies. Uh, EEG is electroencephalography. And if you have sensors on the scalp, you can pick up small brainwave signals from the brain. And only up until now, it's getting really powerful in our ability to interpret and use these signals. And AI is playing a huge role in this story because of the complexity of these signals and trying to draw out information about it. Things like, have you slept well? Are you focusing right now? How's your meditation sessions? And so in the past 10 years, I've just documented what's happening in this neurotechnology field. And this is even before the days of Neuralink, Elon Musk's company. And they're playing a big role. They're raising a lot of awareness of what's happening in brain-computer interface. But it's also a little scary in, the, in their regard, right? You have to get surgery. The sensors are put directly on your brain. Most people are never going to get that done in the near future. But what I think a lot of people don't realize is there's a lot of wearable technologies that provide really useful data that we can just put on like a pair of headphones. And uh, that's really where the field is headed right now. So my YouTube channel is all about... Uh, the product reviews, tutorials about how to use the devices for certain use cases, like to improve your sleep or your focus or your meditation, as well as just interviewing people in the field that are really on ground zero of develop, developing this technology. And more lately, it's become even ethical debates of like, what are we going to do with this technology? Uh, Nita Farenhani is a professor at uh, Duke that uh, has been a lot, on a lot of news programs here lately who talks about this in her book, Battle for Your Brain. And she came on my YouTube channel and uh, we talked and she goes over the ethics of this because we're starting to be able to detect people's attention. So you can imagine like um, certain companies are going to require their drivers and commercial vehicles to wear headphones to detect whether they're drowsy or not to protect, to, uh, to avoid crashes. That's really cool. Yeah. There's um uh, and then all the caveats that come with that. We're not down to the level of tracking thought per thought. And and one good thing is that most of the hardcore uh, brain being able to tell what you're looking at or listening to is can only be done with $3 million MRI machines at this point after the fact that they've got your brain scan, after the fact that you've trained uh, with an AI algorithm for uh, for weeks beforehand. So the AI has to learn about how your brain patterns are set up. But that hardcore stuff, uh, you can't get without a person's permission, basically, because the person has to actually train the AI themselves. But, I have several different questions. I have three of them on the top of my head. So first one, uh, like at what point, or is it being currently used, the wearables being used for those who are, have already had these physical um, like these IED individuals that have physical damage to their brain, are these wearables being used for them? Yeah, in some cases, uh, the meditation training can be very helpful for someone who has anxiety from uh, traumatic brain injury type 
injuries. And uh, so the neurofeedback exercises can help with anxiety. There's also a lot of evidence recently for photobiomodulation. So you can take a, a red light and pulse it and activate the mitochondria in your brain. And we've seen a lot of other uh, red light therapies for skin, hair growth come out here recently, but it also can be very therapeutic for the brain as well. And I'm working with a company called Sensei that incorporated that into their headset. It's like a pair of headphones with EEG sensors, but also the photobiomodulation diodes that activate your brain. And uh, so that could be good treatment for a lot of chronic ailments. I can't sit here and say it treats depression because that would be a violation of the Federal Trade Commission and the FDA. But I can say that it'll help, uh, you know, reset your brain, encourage brain health and uh, various other metrics. I could go into the the biometrics that it's measuring. But uh, I do. That was my second question. What exactly are we measuring? <laughs> right, right. So uh, Sensei, for example, comes with a little box that you can uh, test your reaction time with. So it'll do an arrow left or right. And so. On the surface level, that's not that impressive, right? It's just like tracking how fast you can, uh, you know, react to the the arrows. But what it's actually doing is measuring uh, your brain waves at the same time. So it's getting that hardcore uh, information about how quickly your brain is reacting to that stimuli, and they're called evoke related potentials. So there's a spike in your neuronal activity when you do see, uh, and you can make errors, right? So like you're only supposed to click it if the arrows point in a certain way. So if you make a an error, that's impulse control difficulties, right? There's measurements like that. There's also one that's becoming really interesting called peak alpha. So EEG is really complex uh, brainwave patterns. And traditionally what we've done is break that down into different frequency waves. So the slow waves are like delta and theta. Those come up when you sleep. Uh, getting a little bit quicker is in the alpha range, which is 8 to 13 uh, oscillations per second. And that tends to be higher with uh, relaxed attention or meditation. And then up higher is uh, beta and gamma. But within that alpha band, there's something called peak alpha that actually changes with age. And in some studies has been uh, linked to IQ scores as well. And that same headset that I was talking about, Sensei, they've actually been able to show that they can increase your peak alpha with their training sessions with the photobiomodulation as well as the neurofeedback sessions in the device. So it's like true on hardcore brain training with actual like data that your brain is getting better. That's amazing. Yeah. Like for anybody in, in any sort of, like anybody that has a desire to be, has have self-improvement in their lives in any field of their desire can apply this and just be a better human. Yeah. And every, like to podcast, if I can do this 30, I don't know how, how long do you sit with them for? Uh, 15 to 30 minutes. So yeah. Let's say I sit with it for 30 minutes before a podcast. And because of that, I am more attentive and ask better questions and therefore a better content creator, like all day. Like who, who wouldn't want to do that? Do you ever use them before you record your own videos? Yeah, so the one that I like to use before, I call this my primer. This is called Mendy. It's from uh, from Sweden. So this one actually tracks blood flow. It's got a red light laser that goes through your scalp to your brain, and then it bounces back to the sensors, and it can tell how much blood flow is going to your frontal lobe. That's crazy. So I use it as a primer because if you increase blood flow to your frontal lobe, that sort of activates all the attention circuitry and uh, all the attention circuitry. So I like to use it before my meditations, actually, because I notice that if I do five to 10 minutes of this and then go into my meditation session, my focus is a lot more durable. It's a lot more centered. And the meditation really benefits from that because the more that you can harness your attention on a meditation object, the more you're going to elicit the meditation phenomena that are really enjoyable, like euphoria or um, just feeling really connected to gratitude, that mindfulness. Seems, yeah. Yes, gratitude as well. Beautiful. Um, and for those of you that are intimidated by biometrics and brainwaves and, you know, all the jargon I'm throwing out there, what's really exciting right now is that these language generating models, ChatGPT, Gemini, uh, they're starting to make it a lot more simple for people because those AI engines can take that complex complexity of data and boil it down to uh, really useful insights, um, a video series that I've been doing lately is taking data off this one, which is the uh, the Muse headband. This is a company that I've been working with for for years, and this is a soft band. It's got EEG sensors on the inside there. This is the meditation neurofeedback one, 
and I can get the raw EEG data off this one and get reports. So I've been loading it into ChatGPT and ChatGPT can actually tell if my eyes are open, if their eyes closed, it can calculate peak alpha for me. And a video that I just posted yesterday, it, it kind of blew me away. So alpha will go up when you close your eyes. And the amount that it goes up can actually be indicative of if you're a meditator or not. So I took the data and loaded it into ChatGPT and it was like, hey, your alpha went up by 157% when you closed your eyes. The average for the population is 50%, like you must meditate. So I had this very kind of like out of body, just weird experience where ChatGPT has almost become like a trusted advisor. You know, like imagine if you had a world expert of neuroscience that's getting all the data about neurofeedback and brain metrics from all of human knowledge, and it's telling you something about yourself that feels really good. Like it stroked my ego. It was like, wow, like we can really see from your brain that you're a meditator, that that you've been doing good work here. And uh, I just posted that on LinkedIn, the results and from that YouTube video. And I was just like, I guess I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Like, because the way that I see it is that the AI kind of becomes this trusted advisor. And from a mental health therapy standpoint, a lot of therapists are supportive. They're like telling you where you're doing good. They give you ideas on where you can improve and they're just there for you. And that's what it feels like chat GPT has been for me as far as looking at my brainwaves. I think understanding my brand has helped coming from chat GPT. It's like, Hey, can you review these videos for me? And then, uh, let me know like what is who is Ben or what is the podcast uh, stand for and it's listening and like getting the feedback and like the way it's the way it's verbalized is so insanely insightful and like really again yes. like kind of strokes your ego a little bit I was like yes. man that is yeah that's me of course that's me you know um I I wonder do you get do you, so you're 150 percent at um while eyes are closed, does does meditating bring your baseline to something that would also be a higher than normal? Like if if me, like oh wow we recognize that you're a meditator by 150 percent because you close your eyes. Does baseline now like can you improve that baseline just by meditating? Is that the idea? I think that there's some documentation on that that you can increase the day to day amplitude. But I think that what the most literature focuses on is the delta the change between eyes open eyes closed like how much does it increase why i, I don't think anybody knows okay and these are one of the many mysteries of neuroscience we've <laughs> never had devices like this that have democratized neuroscience these these companies don't get enough credit because up until now most neuroscience studies are done with like 20 graduate students at in some research laboratory at some academia and there are thousands of these devices, tens of thousands of these devices on the market now. So these companies, the, the data isn't as good, right? As if you had someone linked up to a clinical grade EEG machine, but it's good enough. And what they have is the power of raw amount of data. So if you have 10,000 people that are using the device and you can see what is the peak alpha from zero to 81 years of age, they're learning things that we never knew about brain metrics and how to actually track brain health and how to do things like measure sleep, focus, meditation. This makes me like very excited. And part of it is my assumption is that if we can detect somebody's, you know, hyperactivity or anxiety or depression, and that these are, these are real things we can give a, I would, I would imagine a more accurate dose of a medication or a prescription that is true to that unique individual. Cause I've, I've gotten on the phone with a psychiatrist in the past and it, after like f a five minute conversation with very few questions, he's like, all right, we're going to go ahead and put you on Wilbutrin. We're going to start you with the lowest dose and we're going to go from there. And I was like, you're not asking if I'm eating right. You're not asking how my sleep is. You're not asking if I'm drinking, if I'm working out. So you're going based off of a couple different, how are you feeling today? Well, I'm not really feeling that great. Oh, okay. You're probably, probably well, Butrin. Like this isn't, that's insane to me versus, okay, well, let's send you out a product. You're going to wear this product for whoever an average amount, like an ideal amount of time to get an average 
look at the at the brain. So like so say seven days, for example, and then now we can give you a better prescription for what you maybe you just need more sleep, man. Like that's 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 your big problem. It's like, oh, okay. Cool. And like, it keeps my body healthier. Uh, I don't, I'm not putting a bunch of stuff and just hoping for the best and trying all these different medications. I can actually get something that's true to what's going on. Everything you said was spot on. I mean, these are the metrics that we're going to be able to get from these wearables. I'm really excited about this pair of headphones. It's coming out next month in June. And I'm excited to say that I'm like one of the very few partners that they're working with. Cause I did some work with them at consumer electronics show and they really liked the videos been you know having calls with them for a year leading up to uh june here and there's going to be a big new york times article about their headphones because it's really been validated by a lot of uh neuroscientists it's for focus and they've uh won several contracts with the military uh car companies and uh this is really the first time that one of these technologies has been incorporated into a form factor that people could be using just at Starbucks. Because one of the problems with these headbands, right? Like, look at this emotive headband. <laughs> this one is really cool in that it gives you all these different metrics for for attention, excitement, engagement, for neuromarketing purposes. But it looks ridiculous, right? Like, <laughs> who's going to wear this in a Starbucks? <laughs> you know, I think it looks kind of cool, but I, I would never actually cool, use but... it in a Starbucks and let alone like the average consumer, right? Yeah. But if you put this into a pair of headphones, it's a complete game changer. And just the the accuracy of the focus tracking is really going to help with uh, a lot of what you said, which is like, what is your focus doing? Is this due to a lack of sleep? Is this distractions in your environment? Or is there an actual like anatomical slash chemical issue that you have with staying in the right brain circuitry to maintain attention for long periods of time. And will, will medication fix that or not? Will it help? I wonder, I, just kind of throwing this out there, how, do, how would this help and would it help be able to predict some Alzheimer's or like some preventative measures for some mental health like mental disease or brain diseases um to, is that something that they're, they're, they're being considered yeah absolutely and the the science is uh still inconclusive at this point but there is a lot of evidence that um things like peak alpha as well as uh, something else called eeg entropy could be related to uh mild cognitive impairment mci which is the precursor to alzheimer's so we're finding markers that allow for early detection, which in some cases can be the most important part because we really don't have any reversal pharmaceuticals for Alzheimer's at this point. So I, if someone is going through mild cognitive impairment, you can be like, you know what? You need to cu cut sugar out of your diet because it's literally poisoning your brain. You're not getting enough sleep. You need to take care of yourself because if you don't in 10 years, you're not going to be able to remember your family members' names or something like that, you know? Maybe a maybe a bad question, an uneducated question, but can if if I find what's the what's the um, the term that you're using for my, mild cognitive impairment, myo cognitive mild mild it's sorry mild, mild cognitive impairment. Um, if I recognize it early enough on, can I pretty much can I eliminate the chance of Alzheimer's, or do I just like push back that date that I? Uh, eventually will get Alzheimer's. And then does that Alzheimer's uh, look maybe healthier than if I never would have done any pr uh, preventative treatment? It's a good question. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that Alzheimer's is on uh, more of a gray scale, right? So we all actually develop some form of Alzheimer's dementia at some point. We all get oxidative damage and plaques that build up in our brain uh, over time. And this is just unavoidable, but you can limit the amount of degradation over time. And uh, so the answer to the question is that you can improve your cognitive performance on a scale to go to avoid getting so far down that path that you get diagnosed with something like Alzheimer's. Very cool. I like that. That's that's nice. How does this and will it be used? Um, because my my focus is like okay, not my focus, but one of the things that I enjoy is exercise physiology. So I'm wearing these one one of these wearables, and what, at what point does this start entering the performance world in that space? Because I would assume that oh, I can measure reaction times better. That means that my power training is going better, and I'm creating these adaptations out of my brain. 
is it is that already being used or is it like that is that the goal is that the track another excellent question so uh kirk cousins was on uh quarterback with this one uh mind lift is a company that i work with very closely they have an additional electrode that comes out the top so they can get the top of your head and they do neurofeedback training so kirk cousins was using it in uh, the netflix special quarterback okay and then uh, Max Griffin is a UFC fighter that just came out talking about using this one um, with his fights. Uh, wow. I actually went down to the UFC training center to show them uh, this one because the CEO of this one's a good uh, friend of mine. And he he flies in from from Sweden and is like, let's go down to the UFC and show them the Mendy. And, uh, you know, we showed them that it uh, can track blood flow in the frontal lobe. And we haven't heard from them back, you know, that uh, they're – lead trainers i'm sure get offered a lot of different products and try it with their fighters uh so they know about it and uh i just don't know if anybody's using it but there's a couple examples there of uh people using the muse and then another one coming out this summer that i'm excited about is called Python. this is from a company in uh, boston and they've got some real heavyweight uh like biomedical device people on their board and they're they're gearing up for some some major release, but they're already working with uh, professional baseball player uh, organizations. But what it is is a wrist wearable that can track the neural activity from your arm, and it does something similar with the reaction time. If it uh, a certain color of light uh, comes on, you you clench your fist, so it's it's tracking uh, reaction time. With that, uh, I got to try the device here at a Consumer Electronics Show and meet with uh, a couple of their representatives. Uh, this January. But what's also getting really exciting is that there's some evidence that we're going to be able to start actually tracking brain activity from your wrist. So there are patterns associated with alpha and some other key biomarkers that travel all the way down the nerves of your arm to your wrist. And then as you can imagine, that could be incorporated in a, a Google Watch or any Garmin, any of these other watches to actually start monitoring uh, you know, some form of brain activity from, from your wrist, uh, other than just clenching your fist and tracking reaction time, it'll actually be able to track neural activity related to sleep, focus, all that kind of stuff throughout the day, constantly picking mm -hmm. up this data. Data is like, you know, like big, the biggest thing I think in the, in the world at this point, especially like biometric data is, is if, if you're, if I'm looking at any of these, of any of the leading companies in the health and fitness industry, most of them are doing some sort of biometric data. The Whoop, the Aura Rings, um, Apple is is quite advanced in, the, in that space. Um, Apple just filed a patent actually for earbuds with the EEG in it. They haven't come out with the device yet, but everybody's kind of sitting back and watching. And I myself have had a couple of calls with Samsung reached out to me and Samsung Research Division America. And they're like, what is going on with these brain wearables? I mean, that's the power of YouTube. Like like the buzz starts going and they, they search for it on Google and pow, all my videos come up and they're like, okay, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. He's in the mix. So let's reach out to him. I've had so many experiences like that. Uh, actually, I should charge more because right after I talked with them, they made like a million dollar investment in one of the sleep trackers that they told them about called Earable Friends. And I was just like, <laughs> I told you guys about that device. Where's my cut? You know, just <laughs> jokes you aside. But... I mean, I, mean I, I would assume that that's how it's another way to ultimately market yourself, right? It's, it's consulting. I mean, if, if you are a professional in the space, I, I, I do believe that you have the right to, to be able to charge for those kinds of things. It's just Sometimes I wonder how to do it at times. It's like, well, it's confusing, right? Because I want to build relationships with these companies. So uh -huh. I don't want to um, be uninviting to them. But I get plenty of, I get a lot of requests from email to do calls that I just don't have time for. Um, and I wish I could get to everybody. But, you know, just, uh, the sheer volume of like requests that starts coming in, even at 35,000 subscribers on YouTube just gets overwhelming and there's just only, only so much time in the day. But um, I think one way to start, yeah, leveraging that is for consulting fees, but at the same time, um, you know, I want to build relationships and have as many calls with certain organiza organizations as I as I can. So I'm, I'm teasing that out. I actually had discussions with uh, a couple of the YouTubers uh, this past week at the conference about that specifically. So that's a work in progress, but what, what did they recommend? Did they recommend this kind of sequence of like, just, Hey, get your fit in the door, be, be a social human being. And then in 
X amount of years or X amount of time, you finally, you know, you start, you can offer that as a service? Well, uh, the optometrist that I was talking to that has like a million subscribers, literally a, a million subscribers on YouTube was telling me it's time to start uh, charging consulting fees because there's actually a legality behind it. it um, someone took his face with like AI and promoted a product that he had no idea about. So he's actually like in litigation yeah. right now going after this company. It was like an eye patch company that he did not endorse. And the lawyer that told him that when they uh, go after the, after them for uh, compensation. Part of that compensation has something to do with the amount of money that he was charging for consultation fees. Uh, so there's actually some legality there in it. Yeah, uh, I don't. I'm not quite there yet. I think I really focusing on um, just the affiliate sales. Uh, I think I told you um, a couple of weeks ago. That's really my bread and butter right now. And um, you know I do my best not to get too um, ethically uh, mixed up in like, oh, you're getting affiliate sales for this product. Like, of course you're promoting it. And I've been criticized for that before, but I'm like, yeah, but I mean, there's no other products on the market that can do this. I love the product. And like, if you want to help support what I'm doing and want to purchase the product, why not, you know, just go through this affiliate link. You get a discount, I get a kickback. Then I get more time to, investigate this fascinating field which i haven't seen anybody else doing yet so i need as much time back as i can get to to uh educate people on what's going on because i think it's truly transformative it sounds like it I and mean, you're the first person that i've talked to that is diving into this this space of neural data i mean there's a lot of conversations that i've had about like the, the physical data during um the master's degree there was we had they, they're trying to measure how many miles per hour, what is the rate of force development of a specific athlete in, in that in that specific setting. It was a soccer athlete. So how many miles are they running throughout, throughout the, the practice? And then wh how does that translate over to how many hours I should be training? Um, maybe this game was super intensive and I need to back down my, my hours um, of running or weight training this week to allow for better recovery. Um, there's a lot of there's more of that that's come out. There's not very much of what you're doing from what I've seen. Yeah, and one of the other things that I'm getting more keen on and explaining is that there are certain use cases where going directly to the brain data is more useful than what's already on the market. I mean, Aura is a perfect example. I did a comparison between Muse uh, and Aura, and uh, so Aura tracks HRV, body temperature as well as uh, your movements during the night through the accelerometer. But it's um, not going to be as accurate as if you're actually tracking the brain waves when you fall asleep. Um, what the, is that margin of error? Can I, is, ah, do you know? Is that, I mean, that's kind of a hard question. Right. I'd say like by five or 10 minutes, which can actually be pretty significant if you're measuring that transition from light REM to REM and REM is actually one of the most difficult because there's no movement in REM. Aura doesn't get as much data, but like the the Muse headband can pick that up much better because of what the brain waves are doing. Um, another pertinent example is uh, with those uh, the research that Neurable is doing with the Neurable headphones that are coming out in June that I spoke about before is that you would think that if you put like a camera on a commercial truck driver and tracked eye movements and other signals that that would be good enough to tell if they're falling asleep. But the brain metrics are actually up to 20 minutes ahead of crashing the truck in terms of identifying when they're getting drowsy compared to what I can, what eye tracking can do. So those are use cases where we've been doing certain things or hypothesizing about being able to do certain things with uh, health wearables that are really kind of third-party data, you're tracking uh, metrics that are coming from the body instead of where ultimately it's coming from is the brain. So going right to the the source, which is the blood flow patterns or the electrical patterns of the brain itself is providing more accurate data for us to use in, in a lot of use cases. I wonder what else could be measured. Like, is my can I measure a risk of cancer? Can I measure, oh, like my brain starting to produce uh, or wanting to produce more um, specific types of cells. And so then that, you know, that signals being sent out or hormones being like, it's calling for a specific hormone, which if I have this percentage of an increase of this hormone, then that means that 
I may have one of these three types of cancers. Like, is it, does it lead to that direction? I, I would assume. Yeah, I think one of the most uh, readily applicable examples would be epilepsy. Right. So, if someone's prone to seizures, it used to be that they have to go into the hospital. They have to lay in the hospital bed with all these EEG sensors. It's called video EEG. They're there for days. It's very expensive. They might not even have a seizure while they're there. They're just hoping that they have a seizure to show the doctors that like they're going to have this uh, burst of electrical activity in their brain and they're going to seize. But uh, you know, it almost sounds barbaric compared to the other potential, which is putting EEG sensors in earbuds that you carry around or even like a patch that you wear on your head that no one even really can see. And that's detecting the electrical patterns all day. And those electrical patterns from seizures are very strong. So if someone's going into any sort of seizure activity, that's readily picked up by the EEG wearable sensor. And then the doctors have the information about what's happening with the patient. They're understand if the anticonvulsives are really working or not. And they don't have to go into the, the hospital, which is going to be way more expensive because they're going to require, you know, they're taking up a hospital bed. They need the nursing care and all the administrative costs that go with that. So that's an example where it really reduces healthcare costs. It's much better for the doctor and it's much better for the patient. And it's like really useful case use example. I, I think like, you know, my, my electric car is going to connect with my earbuds and if let's say I have uh, epilepsy, I have a risk of, I have my earphones on as, as I'm driving and then my car recognizes or my earphones recognize something that something's happening, communicates to my vehicle and it can like automatically pull me off to the side of the road or like give me a warning like, hey, be careful and we're going to take these, these measures to like keep you safe. So I think that there's a lot of fear and skepticism around these kinds of things, but and I and I see why. Don't get me wrong. I, I get, if I put my you know my tinfoil hat on, I get it. Uh, but there's a lot of safety that's and a lot of cost reduction that would ultimately translate to the consumer. There's a fear of maybe somebody taking that data and using that data for maybe, uh, more control of the individual. Um, which sure, uh, but there's also the opportunity for you taking a little bit more control and proactive, proactively taking care of your life. Yeah, Denver actually just passed uh, the first legis um, legislation protecting brain data health for that very reason. And I think other states are going to follow suit as well because it's becoming more public knowledge that this stuff is around. Uh, Needed Fair and Handy, the lawyer from uh, the attorney from Duke that I mentioned before, she wrote an entire book about this. And um, there's been neuro rights initiatives already getting started to help protect people's brain data. What what, how could it be used maliciously if it was to be used maliciously? So one of the examples uh, Nita gave in her book was actual lie detection. So in the past they would just measure right like perspiration, heart rate, that type of thing. But there is evidence that if you had a person that was guilty of a crime and you showed them certain images, like uh, images of the victims, that their brainwave patterns would be different than someone that was not guilty. That's kind of fun. So it'll tell me like it'll if I have a memory of this person or a memory of this experience and it'll show a spike in X part of my brain versus someone who's just like, oh, wow, that's that's scary or like I don't like that picture. Then it'll cast another sort of uh, wave inside of the brain. Right. Those ERPs that I was talking about, the reaction time ones, there's a lot of them for uh, just getting exposed to certain images or pictures. And um, I think there's more and more evidence that that's doable or possible. Uh, I think that where people get really concerned is they go real sci-fi on it, right? This thing's going to be able to read my thoughts. And we're not quite there yet, but there's more and more evidence that we will be there at some point. I'm thinking it's 10 years away. What's great is we have all these use cases that I described before that could be really helpful for um, various health concerns and you know brain optimization. A lot of the scary stuff is coming out of the full-on functional MRI studies, which if you've ever seen, have you ever had a brain MRI? Probably not a brain MRI, but like any imaging before. I've had imaging, but I've never had a brain MRI. So those machines take up half of a room, right? They cost three to seven million dollars. Uh, the uh, the amount of data precision in those things is way higher than what you would get from 
a pair of headphones, but you can do a lot more with it, which is really exciting. So what they've been doing is showing people images and then taking the brain data and having the AI analyze the brain data and reproducing the same images that they saw. That's fucking weird. It's crazy. (laughs) That's fucking crazy. So if you're showing an image, it has a certain pattern of blood flow in your brain. So all, all the AI is doing is reading that those blood flow patterns and can and interpret the picture. It. Weird. And then let's go a step further. So I just got contacted by a group in uh, Paris. They're called Obvious. They're a um, AI art trio. Uh, they had a art show in 2018 that received a lot of press from the Times and uh, Forbes because they sold one of their AI paintings in 2018 for $450,000. And so that was a big thing back then, right? Like, oh, this is the first time there's been a legit art show. It's Paris. Like someone actually bought the painting for this amount of money. And it's funny looking back, right? Because we think of AI art now. It's almost become a meme. like more mainstream, <laughs> right? It's not like as, as crazy of a thing. Yeah. So the next project, and he just sent me the, pic, the, 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 the neuroscience paper that's getting uh, peer review right now is, should be published next month, is that um, they created... Uh, images from their mental projection. So if you're showing an image versus if you visualize an image in your mind's eye, it's actually very similar uh, blood flow patterns. So they're able to show that if uh, the guy's name is Pierre, I just talked to him last week, that if they showed him an image and then took away the image and then he remembered the image in his mind's eye, the AI still could recreate the image from his mind's eye. They call that soft visualization, soft memory. That's amazing. But what he was also able to do, and he trained this AI for like months, right? What he was also able to do is use this AI to, um, from scratch, visualize an image in his mind and get the AI to recreate an image. Now it's not perfect, but he could do, uh, with up to 95% accuracy, uh, uh, portrait versus landscape. So if he visualizes a person's face, it'll always put out a person's face. If he uh, visualizes a landscape, it'll almost always put out a landscape. But taking that level of complexity even further, he could visualize a sad face versus a happy face and have it recreate that or a sad landscape versus a happy landscape and recreate that. Fucking insane. And so I'm really excited because they invited uh, me out there and I'm actually going to take my wife and our, our baby and my sister and we're all going to go out there to Paris and he's going to show me uh, the, the AI, the, the brain scanning machine at uh, University of Paris and then they're going to have an art show similar to what they had in 2018 and actually auction off these visualized images through the brain MRI uh, at like an art show. So I'm really excited to go there and document that and make an episode on YouTube about it. You're pulling memories from people's heads and printing them. Mm-hmm. That's insanely cool. It's, it, I, I am one of those, t- I, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna own a tinfoil hat right now and it's kind of scary, but at the same time, like you have the opportunity for somebody who maybe doesn't have the best memory to like help them either, I would imagine, I don't know, retrieve or be able to see or recognize memories. Like you can track Dreams. somebody's, Dreams are a cool one. I did not think about that. Yeah. I think that we'll be able to uh, actually get some output from dreams. And that's kind of like the ultimate psychiatry Freudian. It's almost like coming back, right? It's like we'd actually be able to project uh, a person's dreams. How much does a dream, how much is a dream a, um, not a, not a symptom. What is the word I'm using for it? A, a form of like, sufficient data to understand a person's state of being depends on who you talk to um again that's where psychology and mental health has been for a long time is uh kind of just theories and uh subjective descriptions so there's not a lot of hardcore data on correlating it with uh, you know if people are experiencing depression or anxiety or if they're just happy you know uh, but I would say that Matthew Walker's book's really good on that, Why We Sleep. Um, he actually really cleared up quite a few things for me in understanding why we do have sleep cycles. Um, for the most part, uh, non-REM is to clear out the toxic byproducts of, of the day. 
and clear up memory space basically. But, but REM is really cool. Uh, that's where you dream and it's to actually assimilate what you experienced into knowledge and understanding. So it's putting all those things together. And I think that that, um, when, when the day comes and I think it's a, a ways out that we'd be able to project dreams, uh, in most people, I think that, uh, we'll actually have some data on that. It would be really cool to see people's people's dreams. I have very vivid, very lucid dreams. And so I'll wake up. I, I had one recently where I needed a ride home. This guy was like, oh, I'm going to introduce you to this guy over here. He has a truck. He'll take you to your car. Um, or I needed a ride to my car. So he's driving me to my car. So he swings over there. He talks to the guy. He can hear them talking to each other. And he looks over me. He's like, hey, Ben. And I was, so I walk over there and... Um, get to the side he's like he said he's gonna take you home like you got you taken care of i was like sounds great and then we pull off we're having just a normal conversation I'm sitting in the passenger seat he's sitting in, in the in the driver's seat and he looks over at me and what's your name what are you here and then all of a sudden the, the car in front of us it was snowing outside the car in front of us starts like losing control and like pulls off to the side and then we start losing control and we pull off to the other side uh, when we pull off to the other side he's trying to break he can't we go past these trees and then we fall off the cliff and then half like not halfway through the cliff, but he looks over at me. He's just like, "Hey, I'm I'm really sorry," and I just felt this like deep sense of like sadness and scared, and grabbed onto my my seatbelt and I'm pulling on it to try to like pull myself away from the blast, like it's gonna help. And then all of a sudden, I just have this like, "No, this is what's happening, and it's okay." And like a deep sense of gratitude, I saw my life flash before my eyes in my dream so i saw my parents my family my loved ones all these like weird little clips so so fast and then all of a sudden i felt this heat go from my feet all the way up to my hips and then just black and then like darth vader's breathing just <sighs> and i was dead i was i was done wow. everything was gone and i was just i was in this darkness but i felt such a sense of gratitude and i remember saying like my last words like i love you and that was it and i was done i was gone Wow. It was amazing. But like to be able to like take that and like print it out, it'd be so freaking neat. I mean, a psychoanalyst could uh, meet with you for weeks talking about that <laughs> one dream about how that related to your life, what your goals and aspirations are, what your relationships are with your loved ones. So that's uh, sort of classic psychoanalytic thought from the Freud and young days. And a lot of that is still applicable today. A lot of mental health providers do use uh, psychoanalysis to a degree. They don't usually have people lay down on a couch and, uh, you know, free form thought association. But um, I was actually a skeptic when I first got into mental health treatment as a provider about uh, that type of thing. But I did see how it provides a framework for understanding people's lives. So there's definitely st some utility uh, to all that. But I think that as a field to actually improve people's mental health like we need data and that's what i'm all about kind of the data technology side of things because i just think that there's such a um man there's so many psychoanalysts out there and they'll talk your ear off about it all day long and there's been thousands of books written on it but we've been kind of playing that game for 100 years now like we need to take things to the next level it's been very subjective and theory like it seems subjective to me and then like a lot of theory behind things and you can ask me well how did you feel about the death oh i felt a sense of gratitude and felt something a sense of love oh you must be in a good place in your life right that it's a it's a it's a good um point, uh, pivot i guess or a good analysis but at the same time if you're able to take if i'm wearing a headset or if I'm, and I'm wearing one to sleep and you can track that and see oh, actually in that moment you might have felt that sense of gratitude but really it was uh marked as a, a high sense of depression it's like okay well cool like how do we like what does this mean and how can we use this data um uh, maybe an extreme example and not necessarily like the most applicable but just you know um it gives a much more concrete example of what exactly is going on inside somebody's head rather than just like well, we think that, you know, this is the way that your brain kind of develops in this kind of general range of things based on what we can see. It's no longer just what we can see on the outside, but we, we can track on the inside. Okay, Freud said, you know, we have these between these X years, then we're most likely to do these things. And this is what this means. And if we miss these pieces, then this would how it translates into our future. What what if that was never real? I'm sure there's some base to it, but it will give you a real good 
like definitive line of yes and no's. Um, and I like black and whites, even though I know most life isn't black and whites. Most things are gray. Um, it's nice to have some, some definity in some areas. Yeah. And I just like to think about what it can do for human optimization. That's what I get excited about. I mean, treating disease and illness is great and it, we need it in the world, but I also think that AI is going to get very powerful, very smart, very quick, and that in order to like interface with it, we need new tools. And I think that neurotechnology actually might be one of those tools. For lack of a better way of saying it, I think that we need to have our heads on our shoulders right now and be emotionally uh, you know, centered as much as possible as a society, because we're going to have some really powerful tools here pretty quick, and uh, we need to uh, decide how we're going to manage that moving forward. I would love to see it move into, I mean, I, I think about the sports world, but even outside of the sports world, if I can have better scientists doing better research because they're wearing this thing 30 minutes a day, then now not just me as a human gets to have the benefit of what I'm doing or my team, but on, on a very large scale for society and what we're like striving to push forward towards, um, it really does elevate the human experience in a lot of different really cool ways. I think so. But there's a ton of work to do. I mean, you can talk all day about what possibilities could come up, but it's really piecemeal right now. You know, each one of these devices has like a little piece of the puzzle and there's the really high end stuff, but it's really expensive. And there's the low end stuff and there's so much noise in the signal. And how do you actually get inferences from it? So I'm just really excited to be a part of this and working with these companies to like bring this technology to people, but also be like an interface for the public to uh, react to my videos and see what people are interested in. Cause it's actually really helpful to be able to see the comments on the videos and um, you know, almost like report back to the companies. Like I'm there for the, I'm there for the viewer. Don't get that wrong. And I want to like be transparent about what's going on as much as possible and really develop, uh, deliver value for the viewer. But also a lot of my viewers are people that are in the industry working on the technology and there's a lot to figure out. It's like, um, how do we get these inform factors that people are actually going to use and how do we get, uh, you know, the marketing, right. You know, because there's so many different things you could do with it, but if it's not like actually addressing a pain point in people's lives, people aren't going to be interested in it. That's fair. I really like, yeah. So I want to get, I mean, I really like that a lot. I, I want to get into how you get into being in your space. And I think part of it is because, um, there are a lot of really cool fields. And I think with social media, there's like, I think there's a lot, for whatever reason, a lot of people are leaning towards just being an influencer and tracking their days, but there's an area like people use social media and YouTube to, to really be an educator. Uh, and you started off, you know, uh, trained in this specific field and then just taking the, that knowledge and then applying it into a wearable, right? It's kind of, it's kind of what, it, what it sounds like, right? So you have a, a large foundation of knowledge in the neuroscience space, uh, or neurology, and so and, and psychiatry. So you can take all these this information and these concepts, and then now, okay, now I have a, a really nice base, and I can apply that to a wearable. People that are just like filming themselves kind of hanging out and having a good time, I think, uh, is like that doom scrolling that ultimately comes out into play. But if, if I like being able to sit here and talk with somebody who's in that space and doing the research and is, is, is doing the thing, it's a lot nicer to see rather than somebody just like watching somebody do a sport or something like that. That's just not nearly a, or like do streaming and stuff like that. So how does like my, my interest is if there is somebody who's younger, cause I do have a like, I have a middle-aged audience. So, um, 18 to like, I would say like fifth, like 44, like my, 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 my bulk, um, somebody who is on the earlier end that's trying to go to college or is in college and is like, man, I really want to specify in this really neat field. That's like, that's in the moment growing. How does somebody, you know, take that track of becoming, what is the right way to go? Do they go exercise physiology? Do they go psychology? Are they going into wearables and, and, you know, like in, or um, material sciences? Like there's so many opportunities just off of this one, uh, feel to this one product, like they can go into anything. It's amazing. Right. So like, how did you choose this specific route? I mean, that's exactly why you have to be productive and get work out there so that you get feedback because you can theorize all day about where your career is going to go. But if you hoard it all and you don't share it and get feedback on what people are actually interested in, then you're never going to sort of carve out your niche. And that's where YouTube is actually extremely powerful uh, because of the YouTube analytics are, are very powerful. You can actually see like 
age range of people that are watching your content, other videos that they've watched, uh, what videos of yours they like the most, where they actually stuck around to watch the most on your videos. So I present it right in a very cut and dry way, like, oh, I was a psychiatrist, so I started talking about that on YouTube, and now I'm working with all these wearable uh, companies. But if you actually looked at the trajectory of the last 10 years, there's so many left and right turns, swerving all over the place, misfires, you know, <laughs> just all over the map. And when I first started doing YouTube, like a lot of people, I wanted to talk about self-development and, you know, improving yourself. And what happened is that became extremely saturated. It was just impossible to stand out doing that. And I was doing uh, psychiatry training and getting really interested in uh, brain imaging. So I talked a little bit about that, but I noticed that people couldn't really relate to um, brain imaging or talking about medications back then just because it wasn't their world. You know, they weren't exposed to that type of thing. But, uh, you know, I think somewhere around 2014, I put out uh, actually a motive. This one, uh, the, the black weird looking one had an early uh, prototype device that I made a video about. And lo and behold, people really respond to that video. And I think that it's just the nature of democratizing neuroscience. Like this was actually a device that people could purchase and like hold in their hand at home and feel like they're a part of something. And that's over the years that I realized that the neuroscience wearables was actually perfect for YouTube because people are not going to respond to your content if they feel like they can't own a piece of it or experience a piece of it. And it's that, uh, the fact that they could get interested in that field and, um, want to learn more and see what products are available from a, uh, you know, subject matter expert, and then, you know, make a purchase and get it at home and like watch more tutorial videos on how to use it. And then, um, you know, just interact with it and have it become palpable, I think was, was the most powerful part. And that was developed over years of testing things on YouTube, seeing what people react to. And I'm still testing and it's still a work in progress and I'm nowhere near to where I want to be. But, uh, for a person starting out, that's my main message is that, uh, I, and I think Mr. Beast says this too, like, don't come to me like asking for advice on where you should go with your videos until you've made a hundred videos, because through that process, you'll discover what you're actually interested in and what the audience is responding to. And it's that intersection, that Venn diagram. And then hopefully you can, you know, the third piece is that Venn diagram is like, how do you actually make money from it, from it to support yourself? Because you need to free up your time in order to do something like this full time. Cause I can tell you that it makes, it takes me at least 40 hours, you know, to make a video. So I'm working all week by myself in my studio to create these videos. And, um, I mean, that's why one of the reasons why I think this has taken as long as it has is that the industry needed to, um, sort of get to the point where it is with AI right now to make the devices a lot more powerful, but also, man, I was a U.S. Navy a lieutenant commander psychiatrist running a whole outpatient clinic. Like I only had so much time for videos until 2021 when I finally had my, uh, my payback completed and completed my service. And, you know, that was all well and good. I got excellent training and it really set me up, I think, to, uh, get to the next phase, but it's really been only these last two and a half years that I've freed up my time to do this even more. And it's just like grown so much from that. Beautiful. How does um, the military in are, are is the military incorporating these kind of wearables at all? Yeah, uh, Neurable just got a big uh, government oh, military contract. That. Yeah, so um, the fatigue tracking's big. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, putting these devices into fighter pilot helmets, which I find really exciting because I love like fighter jets and fighter <laughs> pilots. And there was actually a uh, one point where I was uh, had met with the leadership over at uh, Nellis Air Force Base, and uh, they were talking about incorporating these technologies into their fighter pilot helmets. <clears throat> so I was trying to weasel my way into flying with the uh, Thunderbirds and the F-16s to make a video and, uh, you know, do their brain tracking. It never materialized. One of the many projects that don't work out, and I guess that's yeah. my other uh, piece of advice, is like, <clears throat> you're going to as you're starting out, but even more advanced in your career, like 80% of what you try is going to fail. It's that 20 that really like takes off for you. So if, if you start a project and it fails, like don't get down about it, like keep moving forward. And then you'll notice that projects will resurrect, you know, 
because I was talking to the Air Force with a different company and that one kind of went on the wayside. And then now Neurable has a contract with them. So that project might actually come to fruition at some point. So um, yeah, getting back to the military question, there's a lot of applications and uh, focus tracking and sleep tracking is definitely one of them. It's very cool. I know, I know we're kind of like, I just, it, you mentioned the military and it kind of it, it just, it was a thought. Um, I one of my friends is a is an aerospace physiologist for the Navy, and so I, he's flown in some some F sixteens and some uh, some really cool jets and some some uh, helicopters, and he sends me like Snapchats every so often. I'm like, dude, like what an experience! Like to go from um, doing research on you know in exercise physiology, doing like wet lab stuff and applied stuff to working directly with military personnel on it, it was just it's fun to see that there is there's there's a there's an area of opportunity in things, even if it's not in the content creator world. My 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 thing is when when I was growing up, I, I didn't know that there was anything outside of being like a uh, like a, a I guess a doctor or a lawyer, and then you have um, like a cop or a teacher, right? Like you have very very like blue collar kind of work, and then you have like a couple different uh, iconic uh, white collar jobs. But then you have these opportunities in in research or in wearables or in um, biometrics and feedback and um i think material science is, is a fun one like what does it take for someone to actually go in and build that like what the research that goes behind okay well these we know that these metals are more conductive than these but then these don't really work well because they're toxic to the human body like working and across be, between different um uh research Entities, so like engineering versus biomedical sciences and like putting those two things together is becoming more popular in the research world in the research world, much more collaboration, I think, outside of uh, just exercise physiology, staying with exercise, engineering, just staying with ex engineering. They're now starting to um, promote this idea of cross collaboration and little things like that that are just like, again, like for me, if I was a kid and I was like, man, like this is going to be a thing one day, like how can I get involved? Right. And so it's just, it's fun, even if you're a content creator or not, you know. I think that's where. <clears throat> I think that's where the entrepreneurialism, but also the uh, the gig economy frees people up a bit. So if people want to sort of carve out their own path uh, more than just being a W-2 employee, not that there's anything wrong with that if people you know want to stick with a company and uh, provide value in that way, and that can be uh, one way to success. But the other way, probably the more difficult way, <laughs> is to Seriously. piece together a uh an existence uh where you are getting a bunch of uh contract work through 1099s that means that you have to take care of your own healthcare insurance and uh you know file your own taxes at the end of the year cuz no one's paying your taxes every month you have to pay them <laughs> yourself every quarter or at the end of the year in a lump sum and you got to figure that all out yourself so that's where i sort of had to put on my big boy pants and be like you know what cuz i tried a couple of congressionally funded studies in the Navy, when I was active duty, uh, using the Muse headband, for example, uh, and we have months of preparation, we got the medical school involved, we presented the, the study proposal, and ultimately it didn't get picked. And I'm like, why did I just spend so much time on a study that didn't get picked up? Like, YouTube is so much more powerful. Like, I want to recapture my time. That's why I left the military. And... Um, but then there's all these things that you have to figure out. And it was not an easy transition. I would, my anxiety was out of control. I would felt just so, I had dreamt about the opportunity to be on my own for so long, but you get to the age of being 32 and having been in that pipeline for so long, you have high school, college, medical school, military training, military service, all I've been in institutions my entire adult life. And then just to cut that cord behind you and just go off on your own. It takes a little <laughs> while. It takes two, a couple of years to figure things out. And I uh, get a mentor, I guess, is the other uh, advice that I would have. Be, nice. I would be nowhere near where I'm at without uh, all the mentors that I've had in my life and pay for them. Like pay for high ticket mentors. Like it's really worth your money. Uh, people are really down about uh, higher education these days, about you know wasting your money on um, you know college courses that aren't going to benefit you. And I I see I see that I'm actually like a very true believer of that. But when you start carving your own path and actually know what you want, and there's plenty of coaches out there that can that are there that 
have businesses that coach other people to get there. And YouTube is a perfect example of that. There's a lot of people that have been uh, successful on YouTube and have formed entire companies around that, like Think Media that I was talking about before. And if you have to pay tens of thousands of dollars over years of, of training to get to where you want to be, do it because it's going to cut your learning curve so quickly. And uh, it's like impossible to figure this stuff out on your own. You know, you need someone to to guide you. You can take a, don't get me wrong. Don't like, don't, don't not do any work because you don't have a mentor yet. Like you, you start trying to put out content or building a business or building software or whatever you're working on, you know, create something, get feedback on it and iterate, but also like pick up mentors along the way. Uh, and things will come to you. Like I'm a big believer in the law of attraction, actually. Like if you know what you want and you, you visualize it, like you're going to, activate your brain like even if the physical universe isn't responding to your thoughts which is what some people think that it does the fact that you've woke your brain up to the opportunities that come across your way that you're not going to see unless you know what you want and sort of carve out your path uh you know i i'm a big believer in all that self-help uh law of attraction uh framework of of going about this but um definitely get mentors I think the most successful people that I've had on the podcast are they share that quality, right? It's law of attraction is real. If you think about these things, if they think that the opportunity is actually there, then your eye will turn towards, oh, hey, like maybe, you know, like if I'm interested in sales, like, and then every single person now becomes a sailing point, right? Um, if I'm a realtor, then I'm always looking at houses, right? It's like the, whatever you really, really want to get into, even if it's maybe not the best video in the world, just post your first video, just do the thing. And having mentors is helpful. You're either spending money on going out, having food, getting drinks and hanging out with friends or whatever, or you're spending money on your education in some sort of way. And you might as well put that money back towards you. And it also gives you a better understanding of like, okay, these people I should spend money with and these people I shouldn't spend money with. And then a lot of times it doesn't necessarily need to be somebody in the, if you're starting out, like a mentor could be somebody that's just like talking about like be somebody that is checking. That's like, Hey, like, are you eating all right? Are you doing okay? Like, these are the steps. Like, are you thinking about these things? And then maybe you have a coach that's specifically inside of business and you have a coach that's specifically inside of health and fitness, right? Like I have a therapist, I have a coach, I have, you know, like you can, you can set your life up in a way that you're surrounded by people that are ultimately benefiting your life. But yeah, you're, you're paying for it. It's kind of, that's, that's the name of the game. It's a, it's a, it's a form of energy that you're providing the, to them so that they can provide to you, um, in a way that like, that will speed up that, that, that process pretty significantly, I think. Yeah. And you brought up another good point, which is like forming the community around you as well. Cause it can get isolating. Like after I left the military and I'm just like working out of my studio every day, just by myself on YouTube videos, I mean, you start to just feel disconnected from society. It's like, I'm not commuting to work anymore. Like I don't have any water cooler talk like on my breaks, you know, I, uh, so just forming those relationships with either mentors or colleagues that are trying to do, uh, what you're doing. It's actually really helpful for your mental health. I've realized, um, when I first uh, left the military, I was like, Oh, thank God. I don't have to talk to people anymore. You know, I can just, you know, go up into my studio and, uh, work on my stuff and this is going to be great. And then as I whittle, cause I do a little telemedicine as well, just to like keep my clinical chops up. And, uh, uh, at, at the beginning, it was more important for paying the bills. Now that the channel has gotten to the level where it's sustaining, uh, you know, financial independence, I don't need it as much. So I've scaled it back. But what I realized is that like, Oh my God, I haven't talked to anybody all day. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I feel like so like, restless or just having no structure to your day and being like, well, what am I working on today? Well, I guess I'm working on that video, but like, <laughs> you know, like, so you just have to kind of like really, I like to keep it flexible. There's days where I'm just, I'm sitting here and like, I have a, I, I want to create as strict of a schedule that I can. So either the goals for the day is a good one. Uh, and then I prioritize those goals after I've written down. It's like, these are the things I definitely need to get down. Um, and then I started doing like, okay, Mondays are editing days. Tuesdays are marketing days. Wednesday is, 
uh, personal training days, um, you know, whatever, like set a specific highlighted goal for that day. Uh, this is my posting day so that you can guarantee that one thing and everything kind of surrounds that, that opportunity. So that's been very helpful, but there are times where I'm just sitting here for like four or five hours and I get up and I'm like, I haven't looked, I haven't talked to anybody. I haven't done like, I got to go out for a walk. I haven't seen the sun. Like my, my, everything's closed off in here. So it's just the lights that I'm just sitting in. It, it's, it's oddly fatiguing. Like the brain fog. Sometimes I'll have a client at the end of the day and I'm like, I mean, this is like so refreshing. <laughs> it's nice. What I've come to realize is that you can get overwhelmed by freedom in a way, because for example, if I'm working on a video, Monday comes up. Yes. I'm like so excited to like not have to go into work today. <laughs> Basically I'm going into my studio. I'm doing what I want. But so Monday is sort of my brainstorming day, right? Like ideally I have ideas and maybe I've even worked on the video a little bit during the weekend, just like so, a little bit of prep work to get ready for the, for the five day haul. But like a lot of times on Monday, I'm just trying to figure out, I, I know the topic, but narrowing it down to a script that I can describe in eight to 12 minutes is a little overwhelming right now. Like I don't know what angle to take. And I noticed that my mood tends to get better towards the end of the week, mainly because not that the weekend's coming because my whole week is a weekend, you know, I'm like doing what I want to do, but because like I created more structure because by, by Tuesday or Wednesday, the script is finished. Like, ah, like I know, like it's, it's, it's organized. Like, thank yeah. God, like I have some more organization to my week now. And then I film. And then after I film, I'm like, I'm feeling really good because like, all I need to do now is edit it and then upload it. And then it's like a big accomplishment, you know, like each video is like an accomplishment. So like the more structure that I get through the week, if I'm trying to post a video uh, once a week, throughout the month, that's how my weeks typically look like, you know, it's like Monday feels a little chaotic. I'm trying to like figure out my life, which is this video right now. <laughs> Tuesday, I've got more structure. And then by, you know, Thursday I'm on cloud nine. Cause like, I'm like, ah, like the video's done. I'm just adding in some B-roll, a little music here. Yeah. These people are going to love this. I can't wait to release it. Friday is great. Then Saturday is a little stressful. Cause that's usually when I uh, release my videos and I have to kind of sit there watching the, uh, the metrics these days. And then you do this as much in the early days, just because like when you have a couple hundred to a thousand subscribers or so, you know, the, you don't get as much feedback as, as quickly, but at this point, you know, I'll get tens of thousands of impressions pretty quick. So I can actually see the curves, like if the video is going to do well or not. And like, it becomes pretty obvious if like a video is going to tank because the click through rate is, it's just in the toilet, you know, like, a like a 5% click through rate is like, Oh man, like this should be up around like 12 or 13 right now for a good video. Like yeah. th it's Saturday, but I need to like recreate this thumbnail to try to figure out the thumbnail and the title, why people aren't clicking and make it, uh, you know, more enticing to people. So, you know, changing out a, a thumbnail two or three times to try to save a video. And sometimes you save a video and sometimes you don't like yesterday. It's exactly what happened. Like it started out poorly and then I changed the uh, title and the thumbnail and the click through rate went up and it's actually doing w pretty well today. Nice. So uh, fed uh, chat GPT a brain report and it basically it was that 157% increase one that was nice. like, you must be a meditator. I'm like, thanks chat GPT. You've always been there for me. <laughs> if there's anyone that's going to be there for you, it's definitely chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I like talking a uh, shop about this because I think it's, it makes it more normal, I think, at times for me as well. It's like sometimes I'm just I am sitting here like, damn, what am I doing? Like this is this is draining. It can be hard, um, but it can be unnerving because you're not sure if you are going to get the returns for your time. Alex Hormozzi talks about this a lot. There's like a period in entrepreneurship where like things really haven't popped off yet, and you're just kind of like in the grind, and you're just you think it like, wow, I really should be you know getting my. Uh, you know, W2 job and putting the money away in Vanguard so I can retire at some point. But, you know, that's a kind of a slow way to wealth. It's a, it's a, an assurance, it's a sure way to, uh, you know, wealth and retirement. But, um, when you look at how some of these other people do it, it's like, wow. Okay. If I get a little piece of this company and it, uh, <clears throat> you know, does a 10 to $50 million <clears throat> fundraising round, I've got stock options in it, the 10X, 50X. 
That's how you truly. That's my build. retirement right there, and that could take two to four years compared to twenty to forty. It is. It is not for the faint of heart, but there is a high. There's a high return if you just don't stop. Like I think that the percentage of people that do end up quitting is just is probably higher because. I forget what percentage of podcasts stop after episode like 10, but it's something like 99. It's crazy. Like almost all of them. It's almost all podcasts after episode 10, they've fallen off the face of the earth. So if you're still uploading videos and you're on number 10, 20, 30, 50, you know, 50, a hundred, uh, whatever episode you're on, like it's, it's not a small deal and you're like continuously weeding other people out and you're going to continue to have that algorithm ultimately feed back towards towards you and my mentality is like as long as i continue to do this thing the better i'm going to improve in it like this just just keep on doing the thing and you will continuously get better every single conversation understanding how to talk to people even if it's not used in this specific place like every time i go out and i'm working with a client every time i work with if i work with a company i'm doing sales like i'm i'm just that much better of a communicator just because i've practiced ten thousand plus hours of just talking to people all day it's nice well, it's amazing what it does to actually make you a more powerful person in person and in other aspects of your life. Uh, I don't think I was nearly as good of a communicator before I started YouTube, but in the process of just being able to take ideas, refine them, and communicate them on camera has totally made my speech capabilities to a level that they wouldn't be at. And that helps for public speaking. It helps for talking in person. It's almost like this uh, training mechanism that you go through. Yeah. And then, like, I guess going back to longevity, I mean, I absolutely agree. Like, just don't quit. And that's what Dave Ramsey said at this conference today. He's just like, if you, you know, think back to that guy, he's been in the scene for like 40 years just talking about financial <laughs> advice, you know? And that's the, he just like was yelling on stage. He's like, don't quit. Don't pay attention to the trolls. Like, just keep, you know what you're about. Just keep going. And it just inspired me so much. And I got to shake his hand backstage and, uh, you know, take a picture with him. But, uh, you know, just people like that that have been in the game for so long. And it's really important to figure out what your why is because, you know, even in the 10 years that I've been on YouTube, I've seen people come and go. And, you know, they try to catch trends, you know, like either whether it be like carnivore diet or, you know, whatever is the latest trendy thing. You know, they, they come on, they pop off relatively for a year or two and then you just notice like why are they not posting anymore like where did they go and so i feel blessed to have just kind of a, a niche that i feel like i can grow with and develop relationships with not only the consumers that want to try their products but also the companies that are developing and releasing the technology and um, i just get excited about thinking where this stuff is going to be in the next 10 years where I'm going to be in the next 10 years where my friends, my colleagues like yourself are going to be in 10 years and just keep growing with everybody, you know? So I think that that's just priceless advice. Just never give up, you know? Love that. Plug, promote all you got. Well, check out my YouTube. It's uh, called tech for psych, but if you uh, just type in my name on YouTube or Google, a lot of my videos, all my videos will come right up. It's Cody Rawl, MD. I'm on, uh, LinkedIn, I post every once in a while, more of the academic stuff. And then I'm on Instagram as well. But the core is definitely the YouTube channel. Uh, that's where I'm doing my most activity. So if you want to see how I am uh, developing my own AI interface engine to read my mind, uh, tune in because that's a series that's happening right now. I'm working with the developer and we're actually developing some software to help people use these tools more efficiently. And then I've got uh, some really fun ac uh, episodes coming up as well. I've got uh, Cognition, which is a augmented reality, virtual reality headset that uh, senses your brainwaves that allows you to navigate the internet with your mind. Uh, uh, they're flying in next month. I'll be doing a review with them. The Neurable Headphones coming out in June. That's going to be really exciting. And then hopefully uh, this Paris trip in October where I'll go and see how people are projecting images from their minds into art shows. So lots of fun stuff coming up. It's beautiful. You got a lot coming up. We'll definitely have you on again soon. Thanks, this Ben. This is fun. Thanks, Ben. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you for listening to the Ben Nevados podcast. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, and all other major podcast hosting platforms. Be sure to leave us a five-star review on iTunes. 